we are very excited to have here today to have with us the folks from Journey Forward. Uh, Journey Forward is a, located in Canton, Mass, and they are dedicated to improving the lives of those who have suffered a spinal cord injury by applying the latest research on the effects of exercise on spinal cord injury. Journey, they use an intense exercise program to provide recovery, increase overall health, and create independence. Research has shown that this application is beneficial to improving the lives of those with spinal cord injury. And they are located, as I said, in Canton. And I have to say, if anyone ever has a chance to go down there and see their facility, it really is something to see. And I would highly recommend that you get down there and take a look at it. The two speakers are Brett Petcher and, Petcher and Mike Rollins. Brett is Vice President of Operations at Journey Forward. He's been working with individuals with spinal cord injury since 2002. He has his bachelor's degree in kinesiology from San Diego State University and has experience working with athletes and the geriatric population, as well as other neurological disorders, including stroke, MS, and traumatic brain injury. His work at Journey Forward is currently focused on client and staff training, as well as expanding Journey Forward to as many clients as possible. And his mic is turned on. Our second speaker this evening is Mike Rollins. He's a trainer at Journey Forward, and he graduated from Ball State University in 2003 with a degree in exercise science and received his MBA from Providence College in 2006. He's been working with individuals with spinal cord injury for two years. He has extensive experience working as a strength and conditioning coach with athletes from the NCAA, the NBA, Major League Baseball, the NFL, NHL, and the WNBA, as well as the Olympians. His younger sister was also born with spinal bifida, so he has major motivation to be working in this field. So I'd like to welcome Brett to come on up and start. Thank you. First, I'd like to thank Claudine uh, DeJoy and uh, Dr. Williams and Boston Medical Center for having us. We've uh, really liked this lecture series. And when we approached Claudine and said we'd like to present, and she said, yes, we'll do it. So we're excited to be here. So today we want to talk about exercise and how it relates to spinal cord injury specifically. Uh, a lot of the stuff will relate to other neurological disorders as well. Um, so we've kind of broke this into three different sections. So I want to go just a little bit into the science of what the theory is of different exercises and what effects they have on the body, both on a neurological perspective and other health benefits. And then um, what benefit uh, we uh, we can get out of out, out of the different exercises, and we'll get into how we at Journey Forward apply these different theories. Um, basically, taking how would an able-bodied person do certain activities, and what benefits they get. How can we modify some of those things so that they could work with somebody with a spinal cord injury? And then, along with that, like what safety concerns are there? What things do we need to take into account so that? Uh, Nobody's going to get hurt, and that we can we can move move forward. Then I'm going to turn it over to Mike, and Mike's going to take over and do a little exercise uh, and strengthening drill with you, give you some ideas of some breathing techniques, some different exercises that you can do uh, at home. Uh, you'll see there's some Theraband that you've got in your bag, and we've got some that are tied off. That if you need some of those, we can put those at the end. Some exercises that you can do with with little to to no assistance. So first off, we have um, what is the science behind it? So what are the neurological adaptations that exercise provides? So by, and when I say exercise, I really mean a couple things. With one, utilizing the extremities that, that you have function in, but more importantly as well as what happens when we start working with the, with the paralyzed portions and wh whether it be uh, in the legs, the core, wherever and what neurological adaptations can happen from that and what benefits are there. And, and again, the, the, the other health benefits. We all know there's a lot of different secondary complications with spinal cord injury, with pressure sores, uh, urinary tract infections, like a lot of different things. What health benefits come from exercise? So first off, just a, a quick definitions of uh, what exercise has been shown to do is increase neurotrophins, so uh, specific neurotrophins. But what neurotrophins are, are their protein, their enzymes that help to let nerve cells grow, uh, differentiate, and then also existing ones to survive. So these uh, growth factors, there's, there's brain-derived neurotrophin factors, there's glial-derived neurotrophic factors. There's, there's quite a few different ones, and some of them are specifically triggered 
through exercise or that they're that they increase their their work during exercise and that the, because of exercise uh, they they increase and promote more cell growth and maintaining of, of the nervous system or increasing the nervous system activity so um, that's one aspect of what neurological benefits can happen from from exercising and this is research that's been done on actually exercising the the paralyzed areas of the body so whether it be doing gait training or uh, different movements with the with the affected areas uh, one other aspect is um, so you may know what, what alogliodendrites are uh, basically your nerve cells and your central nervous system have uh, a coating, a sheath is what it's called. It's basically similar to like a wire and the rubber coating that surrounds a wire. Um, that, that rubber coating is called myelin. So in your central nervous system, the entire thing is covered with myelin. So on some spinal cord injuries, the cord, the, or the, the nerve cell could actually be intact, but there's no myelin, so it can't communicate. So the cells that make myelin are called alleliodendrites, and exercise has been shown to also promote uh, an increase in, in alleliodendrite production. So just by exercising, uh, there's, there's more cells uh, there to help myelinate. Um, there's a lot of more research that needs to be done, but that, uh, that, the, 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 that promotes more myelin. So some research that's been specifically done with what types of activities can, can help make these neurological adaptations. First are developmental movement patterns. So what developmental movement patterns are, are based off of how a child starts from, from when they're born all the way to when they're up walking. So they kind of learn how to roll back and forth. They learn how to roll on their stomach. They learn how to get up pull themselves up on things, they learn how to get on their hands and knees, and then to kneel, and then to crawl, and then to take steps. So with actually working with people and putting them through some of these developmental movements um, based off of what level they're at and what things they can do, uh, that those actually will strengthen and strengthen different areas so that they can progress in some of those other and may work with some of those more difficult development movement patterns. Also, passive gait training. Some of these I've got some video as well later on, so I'll, I'll go a little bit deeper into what some of these more specifically are. So passive gait training is having somebody harness where the machine actually does all the work, and they, if they wanted to, they could kind of tune out, but what that does is it actually has benefit, especially if somebody stays really focused on what they're doing, but because the body's getting the stimulus from that gait pattern, that that's actually beneficial to, to the body. Uh, now, to take that to another level is what's called body weight supported treadmill ambulation. So that's one thing that they're actually doing here at Boston Medical Center through the Christopher E. Foundation. There's a group that they created called Neuro Recovery Network that is doing uh, body weight supported treadmill ambulation. So this is a little bit more specific. Somebody's harnessed, they've uh, in, a, in something where they could actually adjust how much body weight the person is bearing compared to how much the machine is carrying and then staff actually helps to move their legs, but you're adjusting on how, how much the, the, the patient is actually doing. And with that, what they found is if you could go at a faster rate, you're actually putting more stress on the nervous system, and when you put more stress on the nervous system, it's much more likely to adapt. So the greater the stress is better. Now, that's what we're figuring out, and a lot of the things are how do we apply it and Body weight support treadmill ambulation is, is a perfect example of, of a way that it's being applied. Another thing that we've done that we've seen is, is spin bike. So actually getting somebody who is paralyzed onto a spin bike that has a flywheel, getting them to pedal the wheel, and they can initially do it but just by rocking their hips back and forth, and that's enough to perpetuate the wheel. That alone makes, they get neurological adaptations from that where their body will start to, and then as they, as they grow and are able to do more and more, they don't need to move their hips as much and their legs start to do more of the work. Um, and then the last aspect is uh, functional electrical stimulation or also FES. Um, some of you may be familiar with that. There's like FES bike, I think it's balling. They're doing some things on FES rowing. Um, 
but basically it's set up where electrodes are placed on different muscle groups in the legs or the arms, and it fires in a sequence that creates a, a uh, uh, to pedal the bike. So it'll, it'll fire the quads oppositely in the, in the hamstrings and, and the person can actually pedal the bike. So a lot of the research that's been done here really helps because uh, it really helps to maintain muscle mass and then also increase circulation. Now, further neurological adaptations than that are, I think they still need to do some more research on it, but it has a lot of health aspects as well that I'll get into on the next slide. But, um, so FES can really help on, on, on maintaining muscle mass, because a lot of times when somebody gets to the point where they've experienced a lot of atrophy, that opens them up a lot more to pressure sores and other secondary problems that are associated with spinal cord injury. So, as we were just discussing with FES, increases in circulation, um, muscle hypertrophy or, or muscle size, uh, and then also what exercise has been shown is that it can actually have an, a positive effect on bowel and bladder function. So as somebody's increases more function and they gain more function, some of the other things tend to improve as well, like bowel and bladder. Um, Weight bearing also has a very positive effect, especially on bone density. So another key secondary complication from spinal cord injury is bone density. So even the most sedentary person is on their feet for at least maybe an hour or two a day. So somebody with a spinal cord injury is probably not on their feet at all, so they're not getting those ground force reactions that really assist in somebody maintaining their bone density. So weight bearing in any type of position is, is, is great for maintaining bone density. And one also is, is it's kind of uh, exercise will also cause increases in strength, which I think is kind of understood. But uh, exercising those specific paralyzed areas will, will increase strength. And then one other more psychological aspect of it as well is that it will, exercise has a positive influence on quality of life and well-being. So especially when somebody can, can do different activities, they can see improvement, whether it's uh, at the gym or in their chair or even what we do is when we get people out of their chair doing different things, whether here getting in, they're taking steps, they're doing different activities, really has a much, a, a very great effect on somebody's well-being. Um, the next, so to just kind of summarize the, the, the science portion of it, the exercise has been shown to prom promote uh, reactivation and reorganization in the central nervous system and also strengthen neural circuitry. So that what's already there gets strengthened and then also helps to promote, promote further growth. Uh, also, there's many other health benefits that help to decrease secondary complications. So the next portion what I'll get into is how can we apply these? So we know that even for anybody, exercise is, is, should be a part of anybody's life. So somebody that's now not experiencing the normal activities of, of again, just with the most sedentary person of walking around on maybe for less than an hour a day, having those uh, ground force reactions and activities on them, with somebody with a spinal cord injury, it's even more important that they're doing something to help maintain the most basic health aspects. So how can we do that? And then also, how can we really not try to limit what we're doing and really think and say, how can we apply what we would do with able-bodied people and do those things with people with spinal cord injuries? And then that brings up the next question, which is what safety concerns and what things do we need to adjust uh, based off of uh, how do we make it safe? So the first uh, aspect and the thing that's probably the most subjective and the hardest thing to measure is what we call dynamic neural stimulation and positional movement. So to kind of the untrained eye, this would be something that is, looks like just normal table range of motion. But what we're really trying to get is the client to focus on what movement we're doing, whether we're having them try to push out, whether we're having them resist whatever we're doing to them, whether we're hafting and when the, where the positional movement comes in is you may get in a certain range where you can either trigger a spasm or, or trigger tone or even trigger function where just in that certain range there's function, but you get outside of that range and then they're not able to do it any longer. 
So what we'll work on is trying to build up that strength as much as we possibly can in that certain range and then try to expand on that as, as, as we move on. And as you can probably understand, it takes a lot of repetitions and it takes a lot of time to try to get somebody to be able to, to expand those movements out. So the next step is how do we incorporate some of these developmental movements? So uh, some of the most basic things are actually yoga positions. So with the developmental movement patterns, uh, again, with, with the activities that a child learns, so how can we do these? If we can get people in positions to get them to start to roll over, to get them to start getting in hands and knees positions, to get them to start coordinating how they would use their upper body, uh, how they would use their upper body in coordination with their lower body and also incorporating the core. So a lot of positions, as you can see here, working on crawling, working on how to maintain that balance in the hips and how that's going to relate. And then also with a, we're bearing weight in different portions of the body through the hip girdle that we're normally not weight bearing, um, uh, you know, when, when somebody's in a chair. Uh, the other aspect is load bearing. So some of the more simple aspects of load bearing are the picture on the right that's just a, that's somebody in a standing frame. Um, just getting to put that load on the body also increases different neurological responses. So if we could get the body into a load bearing position and the body is going to adapt to that. So how can we do that <clears throat> in more specific ways than just trying to get upright and stand? Well, one is uh, the picture on the left here is actually a, a total gym. You've probably seen it on TV. Chuck Norris promotes it. But the trainer actually sits on one end, the client's on the sled. And initially, just with the trainer is doing the work, pushing the, the person up and down on the sled, trying to get the, the client to focus on this, the activity. Now from here what we do is we just, again, it's repetition over repetition, getting those ground force reactions, getting the, the, the client to be able to uh, <clears throat> gain recovery and get different, they'll get different sensations from just this constant load bearing. In this position we could always also do a bunch of different activities. We could sit up, we could work on balance, we could work on rotation, we could work on leg presses in a sitting position, we could do all kinds of different activities while being in a partially load-bearing position the entire time. So um, load-bearing is key. So a lot of the aspect of, of maintaining health, uh, maintaining, trying to create different neurological actions is also uh, key to, to, to get a lot of load-bearing in. So the two forms of load bearing uh, that we got in that we, that we utilize the best are the standing frame and the total gym. So here's an example of it. So here you can see the trainer is on one end. He's going to help the client go up and down on the sled. And initially for somebody that's, that's got some tone, and tone is something that we're actually going to utilize to our advantage. So if we could utilize where some people, when you get them into a load bearing position, they'll immediately get into extension. So if we could do that, we're going to try to utilize that to our advantage. We're going to try to manipulate the quads to with with our hands through different positions to to initiate a, a response. Then like I was saying, we could get somebody to sit up, work on different uh, balance aspects, the rotation, we could do everything from ball tosses. The key is we could do a lot of different activities from this position while maintaining a load bearing uh, state the entire time. So the next is, is something that's kind of new over the last few years at least, or I guess the last four or five years of, of what's been around. So vibration training is, there's a, this is called a power plate. It actually vibrates in three different planes, front to back, side to side, and up and down. Uh, a lot of, initially what it was utilized for is when astronauts would return from, from space or being in space for long periods of time, they would have bone density issues. They've been in a non-weight bearing environment for a long period of time. So they needed to develop a way, well, how can we stimulate their body to help increase the, the load that's on their body is going to help increase their bone density. So this is, this is how this started. And then it kind of went into personal training and athletes and different different professional teams started to get them and that when basically you get somebody on this machine 
and have them do something, the vibration is going to cause their stabilizer muscles to come in and whatever activity they're going to do is going to be a little bit more difficult while they're on here because it's putting a greater demand on the body. So now when we started to look at this and apply how can we utilize this with, with, with our clientele, um, we thought if we could put a greater stress on the body then we can get those same reactions that an athlete can get. So in the video here, you'll see the trainer is sitting on the machine, locking the knees, and what we're trying to do is get her to get in a standing position. You can see it's kind of difficult to get in the position, but once she's there with the trainer's assistance, she can maintain the position, and this machine is vibrating. So she's getting these, this vibration that's going on when your knees are locked out. It kind of goes all the way up to your head. You can only kind of do it for so long before your nose starts to itch. And, um, but then we could also do uh, squats. Uh, we could do different types of things. We could work on rotation. We could work on different activities, all with gaining an increase in this different type of load that's being experienced on the body. So the other is FES. Some of you may have seen this actual bike. Um, this one, uh, uh, there's, there's been, it's kind of gone through different processes. Um, we like this one because it's much smaller um, and somebody can just pull right up to it, get attached. So for you, that, those of you that are not familiar with FES, again, it's electrodes that are placed on the different leg uh, muscle port portions of the muscle that you want to stimulate. So for instance, the main ones are the quads, the hamstrings, and the glutes. So actually take an electrode, place it on the, the upper part and the lower part of each muscle. You connect that to the bike, and the bike will fire in a pattern to get, the, to get those muscles to fire in a pattern to pedal the bike. So in this, in this video, so what's going on is, as you can see, the, as the camera comes around, you'll see the, the electrodes on his legs. But you can see they're firing in a pattern that is assisting him to do that. So that's really helping to, now his muscles are actually flexing. So he's not doing it, the machine is. But, so that's helping to gain uh, an, or maintain muscle mass and as well as to increase circulation. And the muscle mass key is, is very key because one of the biggest problems with uh, secondary complications with someone with spinal cord injury is skin breakdown. So the bigger the muscle is and the more really the more padding that's there, the less likely there is that there's going to be skin breakdown. Another is that we talked about initially was passive gait training. So what we have here is a modified elliptical where somebody's in a harness. This harness isn't, isn't a, really even adjust this it's not adjusting their body weight or how much they're putting on the system. It's actually just harnessing them there. The machine's doing all the work. So the they're just mimicking a gait pattern and getting the client to focus on what they're doing while they're going through this range of motion so that we can mimic those ranges of motion in coordination with doing a lot of the other things. So what neurological adaptions we can get from, from mimicking a gait pattern. Uh, the other is active gait training. So again, going back to the uh, body weight supported treadmill ambulation that they're doing here at Boston Medical Center uh, and getting people upright, getting them taking steps with assistance and getting people where even they're, where they're at the point where they could assist, where they could ambulate on their own um, with little to, to no assistance or assistive devices. So everybody's going to be a little bit different. Um, her injury happens to be very low, so um, we're actually with her trying to focus really on the lower portions of the body, meaning the, uh, the, the calves, the ankles, and activity there. So, um, but once you could get somebody upright and you could see where their different flaws are when they're gait training, when they're locomotoring, and then that's where some of these other activities with load bearing, with doing different positional movements, with developmental movement patterns to associate those to focus on what's going to help to increase when somebody's upright. And then the other thing is safety. So as you can see, when somebody uh, is, is up gate training, when they're taking steps, when they're on the total gym, when they're in their other positions, 
safety is key. So regardless of, you know, if somebody's doing something and they're trying to get out of their range a little bit, regardless of what you're doing, um, safety is a, is a very specific aspect. So some of the things that we require for our program is that people have a bone density uh, assessment. So we n know that their bone density is at a, at a level that we're not worried about, about having a fracture. Or if they have, or if there's somebody that has osteopenia or even osteoporosis, that we're aware of that. So we could kind of, again, it's kind of a catch-22 because bearing load is going to be the thing that affects that the greatest in a positive portion. But also, the if you do something too quickly, you can also have a fracture from from doing something too much. So safety is always a chief concern. Now, with that, what are the challenges of putting together something like this and having um, this available. Uh, so this is kind of from our experience. The, the main challenge from the client's perspective is, is the cost. Uh, it's not cheap to have the qualified staff, the center, the equipment, and everything that's needed to operate a center for this. Our cost for our program is $100 an hour. We're not currently covered by insurance. That's something that we're working on doing, but it's taking some time. So the aspect that we're working on is trying to raise funds. We're a nonprofit organization, so we're raising funds on our own to help supplement the cost so that it's not a cost issue for, for people attending the program. The other is availability. There are other centers that do something similar to us that are located around this, the country, but from the ones that I'm aware of, there's maybe a dozen, maybe a few more than that, so there's not a lot. So availability of programs to people around the country is a little bit limited as well. And transportation, which is an issue as well, is getting from home to to the center. So really where I think this type of activity really fits in is once somebody's gone through their acute care and then they've gone through their outpatient care, then what's the next step? And that they need to keep going and there's something to do and that's where, where we are. Um, and how do they get to us? So um, that's, that's another challenge. Uh, the other is that there needs to be further research. What are the most effective ways that we can apply to somebody with an injury that is, that is going to affect their neurological adjustments, their health adjustments the, the greatest, um, and how we can, can continue to do that. I'm sure what we're thinking is just the latest and greatest right now, 10 years from now, will just kind of be basic. So in summary, uh, exercise shows a, a benefit in, in different neurotrophin legally dendrocyte uh, expression. Uh, there's also a lot of health benefits that will minimize other secondary complications that come along with spinal cord injury. Um, and some of these activities are included are positional movements, developmental movement patterns, load bearing, gait training, FES are all keys to, to a good program. And then again, what we just went over is some of the challenges that come along with that. So what we've done is I'm going to actually turn it over to Mike. He's going to do an exercise portion for us as well. The thing I really want to get home to everybody tonight is that doing something is key. That you need to be doing something. That somebody that's, that's suffered a spinal cord injury, the, the, the exercise portion of their life becomes even more important. There's are even other neurological disorders with MS and stroke, that activity becomes so much more important. So whether it's doing things, exercises, movements, breathing, things that you're doing on your own, in your chair, by yourself, is, is great. It's something that you absolutely need to do and we want to give you some things that you could do with, with little to no assistance and that some people may need some assistance and some help to get in different ranges of motion. And that those, that's, that's an absolute perfect start to get to go on to something. Now, my job is to try to make this so this is more accessible to everybody. So um, keep, uh, keep tabs on us and we'll, we'll, uh, we'll, we'll, we'll continue to do that. So I'm gonna turn it over to Mike. Alrighty, so what I'm going to talk about pretty much is the benefits of exercise and strength training. Uh, whether I'm talking to an average Joe, an elite athlete, or an individual with a spinal cord injury, I'm going to say the same thing. You know, a regular strengthening program has many advantages. It's many benefits. It's going to help you with weight control. 
number one, it's because you're going to build more muscle. And it's a proven fact that muscle burns more calories than fat. It also is going to improve with your ability to perform activities of daily living. It's going to help prevent osteoporosis. Uh, it's going to increase the level of good cholesterol in the body, which is your HDL. And it's going to lower your blood pressure. Uh, proper strengthening exercises are going to also help wheelchair users with the shoulder problems and also decrease the curvature in your spine. Now you may ask me, Mike, you know, where do I start? What do I do? Well, key muscle groups can be strengthened by doing multiple muscle movements, using proper breathing techniques, and by using dumbbells, weight cuffs, fair bands, and certain machines. Now in this part of the presentation, we're going to focus more on the upper body and the core. Uh, also, these exercises can be done in or out of your chair. They can be done by yourself or with assistance if you're strong enough. So what we've done is we've broken down the presentation and the exercise training into phases. <coughs> Excuse me. To keep things simple and help you progress safely. Uh, phase one is breathing exercises. Those are really important. Uh, phase two is going to be shoulder and range of motion. Phase three is assisted core and arms. Phase four, we're going to go into resistance training. Now remember, don't limit yourself to a certain phase. With any exercise program, it's good that you start slow, build endurance, and progress at a steady pace. And that's how you make positive strength gains. Now in phase one, we talk about breathing. Now breathing is important. We breathe subconsciously every day. We take millions of breaths all day. But how often do we practice our breathing? And it's, it's very important, especially for people with SCI. Now, it's going to offer great health, health benefits to individuals with higher and also as well as um, lower injuries. You can start by doing a set of four breathing exercises. You can do them twice in the morning and twice at night. But what I'm going to do is I'm going to go through these breathing exercises for you. And we're going to actually do them together, right? break up the monotony of just talking. Okay? So the first breathing exercise I have is just very simple. We're going to all do this. And actually, in your, in your packet, in your blue packet, there's going to be a sheet in there that's going to have sample exercises. This will be the fun part of the presentation. We're going to go and we're going to look at some of those exercises. We're going to go through the breathing exercises. We're going to go through the, some of the techniques. and kind of follow through so you have this manual at home and you can use that. So at the top of the page, you can see your breathing exercises. The very first one is the most simplest of the breathing exercises. Okay, And we're going to try this together. You're going to take a deep breath. You're going to breathe in. You're going to hold it for five seconds. And then you're going to expel the air out. Very simple. Seems very, very simple. How was that, Justin? All right, nice. Secondly, we're going to take a deep breath, and you're going, to breathe, you're going to breathe in as fast as you can, hold your air, and then you're going to expel that air as fast as you can. So it's going to go, and you're going to breathe out as fast as you can. Everybody give that a try. Ready? Breathe in. Breathe out. Nice, nice. Sounded good. Third, you take a deep breath in and hold it. Take another deep breath in and hold it. Take a third deep breath in and hold it and then expel the air as slow as you can. And we're just working on lung capacity, lung expansion. Here we go. Take a deep breath. Another. Another. And expel nice and slow. God, I feel like a conductor. That was great. That was great. Fourth off, you're going to take a deep breath, and you're going to hold that. And then as you expel the air, you're going to count as fast and as loud as you can. So you definitely want to build up a big breath here. You're going to take it in, and you're going to let it out. What is for fast, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, however high you can count, OK? As fast as you can go. All right, ready? Breathe in, and out you go. I guess people are still counting. Anybody making the 30? Nice, Karen. I like it. I like it. Those are, those are breathing exercises. And what that's going to do is that's going to increase your lung capacity and your lung expansion. And it's, it's going to make it easier to take deep breaths. Uh, it's going to also decrease your risk for respiratory complications such as pneumonia. 
So these are, this is great, and this is a good warm up to do, especially right before you're about to exercise. Now I go to phase two, and we're going to talk about the neck and shoulders, and then we're going to talk about range of motion a little bit. Uh, range of motion is very important. During this phase, if needed, you should find someone to help you with certain range of motion exercises. Uh, when doing that, it helps to have your arms and legs above the heart, because basically what that's going to do is that's going to um, increase the heart rate and allow you to push blood flow away from the heart, uh, excuse me, against gravity. And then you're going to benefit more from that activity. And I'll show you some range of, uh, range of motion exercises a little bit later. We're going to get into that some more. And then we talk about neck and shoulder exercises. Uh, that's going to improve your strength and endurance in the shoulders. And that's a great starting place. It's a great place to build your base. You can start by doing three sets of 10 shoulder shrugs in the morning and in the night. So if you don't know, a shoulder shrug is as simple as just coming up, pinching your ear, coming up, to, trying to pinch your shoulders to your ears, and then bringing it back down. You can do that in your chair. You can do that out of your chair. You can do that laying down. I don't care where you are. You can do shrugs, OK? Just to start strengthening the shoulders. And I feel like that's a great building place to start. Then we move on to pretty much we call this the phase one and two workout. So I'm going to have my good buddy Tim Donovan. He's going to come up. And we're going to go through a couple things. We're going to go through range of motion a little bit and kind of hit through these exercises. So I have Tim slide over. I'm going to grab a couple tools here for Tim. But what's good about this right now is that everyone can hear me, right? Good. Here we go. Tim's been at work all day. So Tim's going to be pretty tight, like any individual. When you sit at a desk all day, It's tough to just get up and go. So what we're going to do is we're going to start easy. We'll start with the easy exercises, build a base. But I think Tim's going to need a little range of motion to start out, OK? So in this phase of the workout, he's going to come in, whether it's at his house or he's at the gym, he's going to do his breathing exercises. Well, Tim's a smooth guy, so he doesn't want to sit in the middle of the gym in front of all the ladies and, and do breathing exercises and count out loud you know, in the middle of the gym. So. He does those in the car, OK? So when he gets into the gym, he wants to do his shoulder shrugs. So Tim will drop his arms right down to the side of his chair, OK? And shoulder shrugs for Tim, they're going to be pretty easy. So if I'm at the gym with Tim, I'm going to get behind him, and I can provide some manual resistance for Tim, OK? So Tim's going to start shrugging for me. Good. Do it again. Nice. One more time. Good. Now, if I'm not at the gym with Tim, and he's by himself, I can add some resistance by adding wrist weights, OK? So we come in. He gets someone to help him with the weights. Good. He drops his arms down to the side. Here's my resistance now, because a regular shoulder shrug is going to be pretty easy for Tim. And he still goes on, and he does his shoulder shrugs. All right, and we'll actually leave those weights on him for the rest of the exercises. So he looks at, he looks at his workout sheet. What do we have next? We have lateral raises. Okay, so Tim drops his arms down to the side of his chair again. Okay, and he begins. We think about okay, what's our main focus when we're working out? Well, for Tim right now, it's going to be range of motion because he's been at work all day. He's pretty tight. OK, so I know the left arm is going to be good. He'll be able to lift that up to 90. But the right arm, it may be a little tight. So what I'm going to do as Tim's assistant is I'm going to let him start the motion. OK, I'm going to let him go as far as he can go. I'm going I'm to see where his range is. And then I'll continue to assist him through the rest of the range of motion so he gets the most out of the exercise. So he's actually making that neurological connection. OK, so we begin to lift. And he goes, he goes, he goes, and I'm going to help him right through that range. And a spasm may come here and there, but we continue to go through the range. Lift up. Good. And we go again. Nice. And he's getting good work in the shoulders. 
Nice. And those are our lateral raises. Okay. For that exercise, we probably would have taken the wrist weights off for Tim, but in, for time, time management here, we're going to leave them on. So, and those are a lateral raise. Tim did a good job with doing those. But I want to make sure that I'm getting Tim, getting the full range of motion so that Tim gets the most out of the exercise. So, fourth on our list, we have bicep curls. Again, he can sit right in his chair or he can get out of his chair to do his bicep curls. Okay. If you have one good hand, one hand that's not so good, maybe you want to grab a weight. You know, maybe you grab some something that's going to help some resistance to, to get the most out of the exercise. Okay, so Tim's by himself. Again, he has the wrist weights on. Tim, give me a bicep curl. It's nice and easy. It's way too easy for Tim. Okay, so me being there for Tim, I'm just going to put a little pressure here. And I'm going to resist his bicep curl. So he's getting the most out of the exercise. Okay. It's always good to have someone here with you, assisting you. There's always someone around. Just say, hey, give me a little resistance while I do my exercise. Works out really well. Good. I take the wrist weights off. What about full range? Excuse me? Full range of motion. For on the bicep curl? Yeah. All the way down. Oh, definitely. He, for time's sake, we didn't get there, but boom, there it is. He has that. And we do it. You're on top of it. I like that. Good deal. Next exercise. See, Tim, you're supposed to get on me, man. You full range of motion. <laughs> Next, we have boxing. Now, we love to do this at Journey Forward, especially if uh, we're on a table and we're doing balance work, we're on the total gym, or whether they're in the chair. Boxing is pretty cool because it works your core, you know, especially if you're balancing. And you're also working, all, you're also incorporating all kinds of different muscles while you're boxing. So what I usually do is I'll get down in front, and Tim's going to reach out. He's going to give me a punch. Now the right arm's going to be pretty stiff, so I'm going to help him get through that range. Boom, boom, boom. Now he's pretty tight, so we may not get full range right now. But as he begins to loosen up. And the more and more he comes to journey forward, the more and more he continues to work out, next thing you know, Tim's giving me that full range of motion. We're moving all over the place. He's throwing jabs. He's throwing hooks. He's throwing uppercuts. We're doing it up. you know. So that's a real good exercise to do. Uh, last but not least, for this set of exercises, we have external and internal rotation. Okay, So what he's going to do is he's going to keep his elbow close to his body. Okay, we'll start with external. All he's going to do is come out, get a nice stretch there, hitting the rotator cuff. And I'm going to help him get that full range of motion through the exercise nice and easy. And all this stuff is so simple. You can do this at home, your living room, right outside in the parking lot. Wherever you need to work out. And in the internal, we're just doing the same. We're just doing the opposite direction. Okay, stay here, Tim. Our next phase is going to be the assisted core and arms phase. Okay, now for this group of exercises, uh, you're going to definitely need someone with you. It can be done. It can be done with assistance or without assistance, just depending on the individual. But I always believe in safety first. Okay, so what we're going to do here is a little bit of core work. Now. Tim doesn't really need me to do core work, but it's always it's always good to just have a spot there. Okay, so while he's in his chair, or again he could be on a table, or he can be on a tonal gym. I'm just gonna have him rock back and forth, getting some good extension, good extend back, good. Just working on getting extension here, and then working on his back stabilizer muscles. Just doing basic back extensions. When I first met Tim. If Tim leaned over like this, he got stuck. But now he's gotten stronger and he's able to really move. And this is going to help him out with basic activities of daily living. Tim drops his remote on the floor, boom, he picks it up. This is as simple as that. We can also go side to side. So he can drop his, he can drop his arms to the side of his chair. Good. And just basically go over, squeeze his obliques. Good. And I'm just here, just spotting him, just to make sure everything goes well. Excellent, Tim. Excellent. 
We also have rows. So for Tim here, we usually put on gloves. There you go, buddy. We get his hands hooked up in here. So we have a good grip in there. Yeah, don't mind the pinky. And we'll just do a basic row. Now I can stand here and hold the band. I can wrap it around my waist. And Tim's just going to go through the motion. He's basically pulling back. And what I want him to focus on is squeezing the scapular muscles back. So he's going to row, give me a good scapular retraction, strengthening those back muscles. Looking good, Tim. Nice. Nice. And as you can see, everybody's different. Tim only uses one glove. That's all he needs. And he uses his other hand to pretty much work on strengthening, strengthening his fingers and his grip. I got it. Our next exercise is I actually use one of our TheraBands. It's a front raise. Now, I really don't know how well Tim can do this exercise. I've never done it with him, but we're going to try it today. Well, I take the TheraBand, and actually you all received the TheraBand tonight. So you t we took the TheraBand and we tied it up. We created a knot in there. And make sure if you need a knot in your TheraBand, we have them up here. We'll be more than happy to give you one with a knot. I'm going to put the band right above his elbows. So I'm locking his arms pretty much. I'm going to have him think about really locking those triceps. He's my prisoner here. Okay, and he's just going to do a front raise. Make sure everybody can see. All right, ready? Lift those arms. Good. And I'm going to help him through the range of motion. Good, ready? Keep those arms straight. Up, 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 up. Good. Ready? Lift. Nice. Last one. Good. Good. That's our front raise with the bands. Is it? Watch the hair. All right. <laughs> and then our last exercise is a tricep extension with assistance. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to really, really try to get his arm. And Tim is pretty tight tonight. So I'm going to get his arm up as high as I can. This is as far as we're going to go tonight, OK? So just depending on how tight you are, how much range you have in your arm, we're just going to get his elbow here, and we're going to allow him to extend the tricep. Good. Now, it gives me good extension. So I'm just going to give him a little bit of resistance through here. There you go, Tim. Looking good. Now, optimally, good, good job. Optimally, I'd love to have his arm way up here and extending all the way up. The more and more we break him down, Tim's really, really good about that. We break him down, then we can get a full range of motion going through the body. So it's very nice, very nice. And keyword. Like my man said here, range of motion, very, very important. Thank you so much, Tim. Everybody give Tim a hand. My next set of exercises are pretty much resistance exercises. Um, individuals with increased functions may find it better to exercise at the gym, um, use modified gloves if needed. And with those modified gloves, guys, you can work out the shoulders, the biceps, triceps, and start using equipment. Uh, if you don't need the gloves, again, and you have some finger and thumb movement, use that. You know, really grab onto the equipment. Use that to strengthen your fingers and your thumbs. It's very important. It's going to improve your strength. Okay? All these exercises, and again, all the exercises that I mentioned earlier can be done. And they might be easy to you. And if they are easy, add resistance to all of them. Because like I said, don't limit yourself to a phase. Go through all these exercises because they're all going to be beneficial to you in your strengthening program. Okay. Now I want to go through some of the sample exercises here. Um, and we can use bands. We can use, like I said, bands, dumbbells, weights, all the equipment here. You can find all this equipment at your local stores. So number one, what am I going to do first? 
So I'm going to warm up. I'm going to do my breathing exercises. Right, there's, I have no shame, so I'll do breathing exercises right in the middle of the gym. Lisa saw me today. I was actually doing breathing exercises today at work. Okay, first off, I want to start with a TheraBand chest press. Okay, so we have bands that are tied with two loops, which are great. Okay, and what I love about tying the two loops is if I don't have finger function, I can wrap them around my wrist like such. Okay, and as you do that, boom. I'm good to go. Now I can use the bands as a chest press. Okay, So it's around my back, and I'm using that as a chest press. Now you want to make sure, if you use it as a chest press, that you take it under the armpits. That is key. There you go. And try to get as much extension as you can. Okay, And again, with those with finger and thumb strength, grip hold of the band. That's important because you want to continue working on your grip. Okay. You can also do TheraBand rows with scapular retractions. Find any household object. Find a weighted chair. Find a banister at home. Uh, stairwells work great. You know, wrap them around a pole of the stairwell. You know, find some way or something to stretch the band out to use that and you could do rows with a scapular retraction, okay? And Tim showed us before, again, all I want you to do is pull and squeeze the shoulder blades back, okay? That's pretty simple. Uh, third off, we have a weighted bicep curl, and Tim already showed us that. It's going to be easy to you. Add some resistance. Uh, we also have the weighted overhead tricep extension. Uh, multiple ways to do that. Again, we did that with Tim. We, uh, we use manual resistance with Tim. If you don't have manual resistance, use a cuff. If you need to use a band, use a band. You know, find, find a way. If you, have finger, if you have finger strength or even if you don't or if you have someone assisting, put that around your wrist or grab it. Set here. Now I've made my tricep extension. Okay, I'm getting tension there. I'm working. Okay? Back extensions. Back extensions are very, very important. Again, working on your back extensions. Tim went through some of those. Uh, we have the weighted oblique crunch. Went through that with Tim as well. Side to side, weighted down. It's a very good exercise. And you're working on your stability. Uh, we also have rotations. Okay, You can do those in your chair easily. Okay, Arms out, and all we're doing is turning. Okay, Working on the stabilizer and core muscles. And again, our key word is range of motion. Range of motion. Um, next exercise, uh, weighted shoulder abduction. Okay. So what we're going to do with that is we're going to take the band, and all we're doing is just opening up. Okay. Grabbing one end, making as much tension as possible. Okay. And doing such. Now I need assistance if I'm going to do abduction. So I'll have my friend help me here. And I am going to take the band and bring it back across the front of the body. Okay? So if you have an assistant there, someone can help you, that's your adduction. Okay? I'm adding my arm to my body. So that's adduction. The other way is abduction. Okay? You can also do weighted flies. And that's just pretty much opening up the body. I can do these just setting, okay? I'm just coming here and I'm just opening up the band, okay? Without finger strength, I just put it on my wrist and I'm opening it up, going through as much range of motion as possible, okay? Uh, and then last but not least, a lot of the boxing stuff. I love incorporating boxing, okay? Karen will tell you, Tim will tell you, anytime you're on the TG or balancing, I want to stimulate your core as much as I can. And boxing does that. It gets you moving around. It gets you testing your limitations. It gets you moving your arms as well as really trying to work your core. So you can go through And if you don't know boxing terminology, I'll kind of help you out with it. Jabs are straightforward. Okay? Hooks are coming across the body. And uppercuts are your knockout blow. Okay? And then for endurance boxing, you pretty much want to go as fast as you can 
as quick as you can for about maybe 20 to 30 seconds, okay? So, you know, have your assistant there with their hands up, kind of moving around, and pretty much you're alternating with the jabs for 20 to 30 seconds, and then you switch and you do hooks for 20 to 30 seconds, and last but not least, you go for uppercuts, 20 to 30 seconds, just really moving around, really working on opening up and, uh, and challenging your stability. And last, to kind of wrap it up, just a thought. I've been big into quotes lately. Strength does not come from physical capacity. It comes from indomitable will. And I think that says a lot for what we do. And uh, not really big on Gandhi, but I think that kind of hit the spot. <laughs> Thank you so much. Um, questions? Yes? I was just curious how often to get some benefit um, more to do with the locomotive training or weight bearing and that types of things because we're looking into a fest bike. How often do you get some of that? Mm -hmm. Do you have to do it every day or three times a week? That's I, I would say at the minimum uh, that somebody's doing something at least three times a week every other day with a lot of things, especially with something like load bearing with, with somebody standing. The more the better if they can do it for an hour or two hours a day. Um, if there's something that they're only able to do, like if they're if they're fed, if they're FBS biking and standing, if maybe they could do uh, stand every day for an hour to two hours and then FBS every other day would be would be a, a, a program I think that would be good. As they build up endurance, then maybe you could incorporate it every day. So a lot of it kind of rather than what's what's the most beneficial kind of turns into what works with the schedule, what works with a lot of other things, so how do you make it work on that aspect? So kind of whatever creates the most consistency. So you say we're gonna do it every day and then you kind of fall off a day and another day and then it kind of falls off. Well, let's start small and do like every other day to something we can stick with. about partnering with uh, YMCA's or other places. Um, do you have locations in other places? Or is Ken the first one? Ken's the first one. So actually our founder's not here tonight. Our founder's Dan Cummings uh, from, from Hyde Park who, who has a flu. So uh, he went to a program similar to what we're doing in California, spent four years there. And when he came back, he said he wanted to start something similar here. So we're the first journey forward. There's other centers that are, that are uh, the closest one probably here is in New Jersey, that I'm aware of, that does more specific of what we do. However, in the Boston area, I think the other best like facility that specializes in working with people with spinal cord injury is the Quincy Y. They have a great program there that they work uh, on doing a lot of things, and that program is, is a lot more cost effective as well. Um, one quick question. When I saw the, the, the little movie you had, the person on the, on the total gym, mm -hmm. um, do people complain of knee pain or, or do you have any problems afterwards in terms of uh, arthritic changes on your knees? Because there was a strong hyper expansion uh, when, when that was done. And, and that piece of position is concerning for us afterwards. Have you had any, any complaints or any problems afterwards uh, with, with the, that particular exercise? Um, well, with some, it depends on, for, for that specific person, their, their normal gait before they were injured, he had pretty, had hyperextension to begin with. Okay. It's something we want to limit. We, we do have some, some people where, where it is an issue where, where we'll actually put a pad behind there yeah. that kind of slides with the total gym so that we only get, so we can limit the, the, the hyperextension. Um, knee pain, I haven't seen a lot of, more of the knee pain kind of comes in with getting into positions on the ground like the hands and knees and those kind of positions where people are actually on their knees. And also going through the motion, we prevent the hyperextension as we go through the motion. So our hands are there, so as they do lock out their knees, we never let them go, to, go all the way into hyperextension. Now in your boxing, when you do it, um, rapidly, mm -hmm. um, you do all three moves at the same time. You can mix it up if you like, but like 
it's, it all depends on your workout, you know. So as, as that's set up, you know, start with each motion and get each motion down before you progress to multiple motions. So if you've been doing it a while and it's getting easy or you just want to break up the monotony, you know, you can do that and mix all three in together. But if I was just starting a program, I would take one step at a time. I would start with each movement, do that for the 20 to 30 seconds, and then mix up the movements. Then that would be good for you. Definitely. You said the cost of art is one hundred dollars, but if somebody wants to come like to the museum or to the museum, they have to be the same day or they have to be five months. The, the fees. Four days later. Yeah. Uh, how we're certain right now we uh, the fees are paid per month, so oh, the, month. somebody would pay. Yeah, so if they pay. Uh, uh, like for, for this month, they would pay at the beginning of the month for whatever sessions and whatever sessions are missed, or if we change, we'll just make it up on the next. Also, with some of the other equipment, um, the the, the the bigger therabands, the arm weights, those you can get very like at local places, or you can get them at places like Perform Better that are online. The gloves uh, are they actually work very well for people to, to give them to, that, that need better help with some, with grip. So for some of the higher level injuries that need some help with with grip, the gloves work great. Uh, those are a little bit harder to find. It's Wisdom King at the website. If you want some more information, our email uh, is in your uh, in your packet. If you have any questions, email. If you just want to know, I can just forward you the website to, to some of the best places, or at least where we pick up some of those things. So. Great, thank you. Thank, thank you. you. If you all fill out your surveys and just you can either leave them on the table or hand them to one of the volunteers on the way out. And again, thank you all for coming. Yay. Good job.